Hey everybody, Mark here with San Diego Miramar College and today we'll be talking about the patient assessment trauma. But before we get into the actual assessment, let's talk about some things that'll be good to know for you guys. Starting here with the algorithm, our trauma assessments for the class, we're teaching you guys how to do a trauma assessment on somebody who has experienced a major mechanism and that'll lead to a rapid secondary. So let's really quickly talk about what makes a major mechanism, okay? So this is straight out of the protocol books as a T460A. This is found in the policy reference section of your protocol books. So take a look at that, follow along. So any vital signs are LOC with the following. So these are, what this does is this creates a protocol for a major trauma victim. So if any of these criteria are met or multiple of them might be met, they need to be declared a major trauma. They need to be taken to a trauma facility and you will definitely be doing a secondary assessment, a rapid secondary. And then there's also some special considerations. So let's go through these. GCS of less than 14, systolic pressure less than 90, respiratory rate less than 10 or greater than 29 in adults. And I'm only gonna worry about adults for this because that's what you will be expected to do your assessment on. All penetrating injuries to head, neck, torso, or extremities proximal to the elbow or the knee. Chest wall instability or deformity, like a flail chest. Two or more proximal long bone fractures. A crush injury with degloved, mangled, or pulseless extremity. Amputation proximal to the wrist or ankle. Pelvic fractures, open or depressed skull fracture, paralysis, neurologic vascular deficit of the extremities. You do your PMS check and they don't check out. Tourniquet applied to a traumatic injury. <clears throat> So that's vital signs, that's anatomy of the injury. Now let's look at the mechanism. Fall greater than three times a patient's height or greater than 15 feet. High risk auto crash. Intrusion, including the roof, greater than or equal to 12 inches or greater than or equal to 18 inches at any site. Ejection from the vehicle, death in same passenger compartment, vehicle telemetry data consistent with high risk of injury. Vehicle rollover with an unrestrained patient auto versus pedestrian or a bicyclist thrown run over or with significant impact motorcycle crash greater than 20 miles an hour exposure to blast or explosion combination of trauma with burns now here we have some special considerations age less than five or greater than 55 low impact mechanisms like your ground level falls with your patient population greater than or equal to 65 years of age bleeding disorders anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy these would be inclusive of blood thinners. Pregnancy greater than 20 weeks, poor baseline physiologic reserve. So they have severe cardiac or respiratory problems and the extrication time is greater than or equal to 20 minutes. EMS provider judgment. So anything that you're worried about, you would use as a special consideration and reevaluate with medical direction and transport to the appropriate facility. When in doubt, take a patient to the appropriate trauma center. That's always some good advice. So let's talk about the actual assessment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've got the scene size up. It's very similar. This is the same study guide template that I use for the medical assessment, only this is trauma. So for scene size up, standard precaution, scene safety, this appears to be a mechanism of injury. There's one patient. I will consider the need for additional resources and I will have a partner immediately hold and maintain spinal motion restriction. Okay, that's very important. Primary survey, general impression, brief statement about age, sex, body position, and stability of the patient. That hasn't changed. AVPU has changed a little bit. Introduce yourself, ask their name, what city they're in, what year it is, and what happened. Remember, for trauma patients, we ask four questions, person, place, time, and event. Are they alert and oriented times four? Chief complaint and life threats, ask where they are experiencing pain. Don't say, why did you call us out here today? Just ask them, where does it hurt? Ask the proctor for any life threats. At this time, it is appropriate to remove restrictive, obtrusive clothing from significant trauma patients. So if you have to cut the shirt off at this time, this would be the appropriate uh, location in the assessment to do that. For the airway, we're gonna check two things. We're gonna assess for patency. You may state the airway is patent if the patient is actually speaking to you. If you need to suction, you just treat as needed. Assess the need for an airway adjunct like the NPA or the OPA. So obviously if they can't maintain their own airway, it's not patent, they're not conscious, they're only alert to painful stimuli or completely unresponsive, you'll choose the appropriate adjunct, NPA or OPA, as needed. Now for breathing, we're gonna 
check three parameters. We're going to assess for rate and tidal volume, treat as needed if you need to provide BVM ventilations, or maybe they were breathing fine on their own, but you assess for adequate oxygenation using a pulse ox and it's a little bit low, maybe 89, 87%. We're gonna use high flow O2 via non rebreather mask at 15 liters a minute. Now I know in the medical assessment, we have said many times that you should use the pulse ox if it's below 94, but above 90, you should use a nasal cannula. For the trauma, if you use oxygen, you should use a non rebreather mask, high flow to 15 liters a minute, because we want to treat these patients for shock and we want to make sure that they have adequate oxygenation. So all of your oxygenation should be non rebreather mask at 15 liters a minute for your trauma patients. And then there's an addition here, manage any injury that may compromise breathing. So for example, sucking chest wound, flail, chest, etc., and you treat that as needed. Again, these are just, these are variables. They all change. You can get different assessments and you're going to react appropriately. For circulation, you've got four parameters. Assess for major bleeding using a hands-on, head-to-toe blood sweep. Treat as needed. So you will actually have to go from the top of the patient all the way down to their feet, checking your hands periodically as you run down their body, checking for any sites of bleeding. And if you do come across one, the proctor indicates that there's some bleeding there, you're gonna to have to apply direct pressure. You're going to have to treat the bleed, whether it be with a tourniquet, if direct pressure controls it, pressure bandage, so on and so forth. Check radio and carotid pulses simultaneously for five to 10 seconds, assess the rate, rhythm, and quality, and you're comparing those two. So you're comparing the carotid strength to the radial strength. Then you assess the skin signs on the forehead or the neck, asking for color, temperature, and condition. Treat the patient for shock, so keep them in a supine or semi-fowler's position. Conserve their body heat with blankets. Heat the ambulance up and provide high-flow oxygen. When we get down to patient priority, this is a priority patient. We will expedite transport, give a couple of reasons to justify this decision. That hasn't changed, but we have an addition here. It is required to assess a GCS on the patient at this point. This must include all components, eyes, verbal, and motor. So Glasgow Coma Score, run through it, score them out of four for eyes, out of five for verbal, out of six for motor. Communicate that to your proctor when you are making the patient priority transport decision. For the history, you'll delegate a sample history off to additional personnel to attain from a bystander or family member, witness, et cetera. So you're actually not responsible for the sample history. Your main focus will be this next section, secondary assessment. So I put a couple of disclaimers up here, unless life-threatening, treat injuries found during the secondary assessment in the next section. Where inspect is indicated, we are generally inspecting for any DCAP BTLS. So that's deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. So when you're going through each of these sections, you don't have to say uh, the entire DCAP BTLS acronym, but you should know the DCAP BTLS acronym. You should say it at least one time in the assessment and what it stands for. If you use the acronym DCAP ETLS, be prepared for the proctor to ask you, hey, what's that stand for? So anyway, this is a very hands-on assessment. We've got a video on it demonstrating it. This is just an explanation. So I'll link that down here as well. But for all of these next parameters, you're actually going to be touching the patient. And especially on test day, it is expected that you get hands-on and you actually assess and inspect appropriately each of these sections. So let's start up here with the head. You're going to inspect the mouth, nose, and the facial area. So if there's any broken facial bones, nose, otherwise, you're going to just ask the proctor, I'm inspecting the mouth, nose, and facial area for any uh, DCAP TLS. Do I find anything? Treat as needed. Inspect and palpate the scalp and the ears. So you'll actually take your fingers and run them behind the patient's head and you will palpate behind their ears as well. Note any findings there. Assess the eyes with a pen light for reactivity. So we're checking for pearl. Note the reactivity. Then we go down to the neck and stay organized. Do not go out of order. These are all the points that you need to hit. This is every single thing on the grade sheet and it needs to be done head, neck, chest, 
so on and so forth. So we'll go down to the neck next, and we're going to check the position of the trachea by palpating. So just run your fingers down that anterior portion of their neck where their trachea is. And just make sure that it's in line. Note any findings if it's not in line. Check the jugular veins for any JVD or jugular venous distension. Note any findings there. And palpate the cervical spine by running your fingers from the bottom of the skull to approximately C7. So you're not doing an entire spinal assessment at this time. You are just checking for any neck injuries. If they have any crepitus or any signs of pain during this assessment, at the end of your palpation would be the appropriate time to apply a cervical collar. And for the chest, we're going to inspect the chest visually for any DCAP BTLS, note any findings. Appropriately palpate the patient's chest, evaluate for any irregularities, note the findings, auscultate second or third, fourth or fifth, we'll do the posterior lung sounds at the end. Abdomen and pelvis, inspect the abdomen, palpate all four quadrants, stop if any rigidity or tenderness is found. Inspect the pelvis, palpate the pelvis properly by placing gentle pressure on the iliac crest. Verbalize assessment of genitalia perineum if indicated. Lower extremities. All right, so you'll inspect and palpate the legs one at a time. You'll use opposing traction to check stability of the bones and joints. So basically, you take your hands and instead of lining them up, you offset your hands and apply pressure in an offset manner to see if there's any instability in those bones or joints. You'll check lower extremity PMS. So that stands for pulse, motor, and sensory function simultaneously. So and we'll go over that more in the lab, but. PMS checks are very important. They're neurological assessment, so you need to actually perform them both on the lower extremities and the upper extremities. So we'll go to the upper extremities next. We'll inspect and palpate the arms one at a time using opposing traction to check the stability of the joints and bones. And then we'll check the upper extremity PMS next. Now we will log roll the patient. So that's usually done on heads count, so we can check the posterior portion of the patient. So we'll inspect and palpate posterior thorax thorax, thoracic, excuse me, thoracic and lumbar spine by running the fingers along the spine. You'll also auscultate posterior lung sounds here. If indicated, verbalize placement of patient onto a spine board or a scoop. And then we go into the last part of our assessment. So we'll get a set of vital signs, same thing. We need the pulse, respiratory rate and quality, blood pressure, skins, pupils. You gotta ask the proctor for all the vital signs listed above. You will not be taking a full set of vital signs. This is just verbalized. And then the treatment of any injuries found during the second assessment will be done after a set of vital signs. Next, you will reassess. You'll demonstrate the appropriate reassessment interval, either five minutes for your unstable patients, 15 minutes for your stable patients, and how you would reassess the injuries the patient has sustained. And that's it. There's actually no verbal report on this one. And considering that it's so hands-on, it's actually a lot easier to remember the steps. It's just a matter of practicing it, and it's just a matter of getting familiar with the material. So we've got this video explaining the assessment. We've also got a demo. I've got that link below. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to message me on Canvas or leave a comment down below. Thank you guys, and I will see you all soon.